so this is a general question for the panel. Uh, there has been a lot of discussion about community composition and relative abundance, but it seems like a lot of what we should be talking about is a quantitative assessment, a, a biomass assessment. So can we reconcile that difference? Can, can we learn anything without looking at biomass, I guess is the question. And the follow-up is, if not, why aren't we looking at biomass much more? Yeah, I think it's a, it's a really good point, Jeff. Um, I, I think it's incumbent upon us to look at biomass in parallel with community composition, but I do think that there's a lot to be gained in looking at patterns of co-association, for example, and um, repeatable patterns of specific organisms found in specific relative abundances across large numbers uh, within a population. I think there's, there's value in that. And I think there's value in moving beyond looking at taxonomy and just who's there and truly understanding how these organisms function. And not just looking at metagenomes, but understanding the products they produce, which form the kind of bioactive molecules that mediate the interaction between these communities and the host, or these micro, microbial communities and the, the, the built environment. Um, so I think that we need a kind of a soup to nuts approach where all those components are, to my mind, relatively equally important. And if we just stay describing communities and not moving towards mechanisms, and, and, and recognizing that there's not just one mechanism, but these are systems in which there are multiple mechanisms and multiple bioactive molecules at play that drive these systems. Um, and that's where I think that the field is headed. It, it's a 10-year-old field. And it's this you know, need for instant gratification. We're really just starting to understand who's there. And I think ultimately we'll push forward to understanding the primary mechanisms that are of greatest importance to the, the studies that we engage in. So uh, I thought you see uh, many people use the pie crust based on 16 to infer the functions. So my question is that uh, how confident are you? So do you have any comparison like is there, so like based on the influence also based on drug domain? Or why don't you use drug domain? I know maybe the, for the human microbiome maybe maybe it's better, but I don't think that for the environment, especially for the soils. I know many people use this. But just uh, for under the assumption it works. I don't know how confident because I was in the SM meeting. I thought many people talked to me this. Some people say good, some people say don't make any sense. So I I wanna see your idea what how good it is, how how confident you are. So I, I think it's imperfect for, well, it's probably imperfect overall. It's even less perfect for environmental samples. If you're hinting that, at that, I agree with you. Uh, the tool does have a way of, of um, kind of giving you output for how confident you want to be in the data. Um, our ultimate goal will be to do some shotgun metagenomics to validate whatever we see uh, by pie crust. But, but yes, I understand why you're bringing up the, the question. Can I just add to that as well? So in a realm where we know so little, any information may be useful information. And we've been pairing pie crust predictions with metabolomic analyses. And we find when we do our, our kind of comparisons uh, in predicted function across groups, and then relate those uh, pathways that are predicted to be enriched in a certain group, we find that many of the products of those pathways are actually found to be significantly enriched in the metabolome. So that's comforting, and that is in the, the gut microbiome, and as you say, it may be better for that. But the, you know, we have to recognize the caveats. Say we don't look at genes that are horizontally transferred between organisms. These are just kind of conserved traits belonging to those organisms. And it's, it's exclusively predictions for bacteria. There are many other organisms in these communities that are contributing to the functional output of these communities. And we don't have uh, a good way to assess those from a predictive uh, uh, capacity. But I do think it's useful, and I, I, we, in our hands, we've been able to basically pinpoint certain pathways that we've then developed hypotheses about, and they've actually borne out in the in vitro and ex vivo studies we've performed on the bench. So I think it's a very useful hypothesis generating tool in a realm where we've very little information. Yeah, so I think it depends on the, what the function you're, you're looking for. So you could, if we look at the general functions, maybe okay. But also, also people talk about the xenobiotics degradation, the capacity of the degradation. 
because I am more familiar with the bio, bio, you know, biosegregation fields. You know, di different strains, quite different. You know, different strains. Uh, so now, set dance top of the genus or family level. So now we really see, we don't know what kind of resolutions below this. So you talk about the xenobiotic segregations, could be very difficult to relate to this. But if you talk about general function like metabolites or like amino acid production or like, you know, lactate production, maybe, maybe, maybe be okay. I think really maybe you should be very careful what they're looking for, what, 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 really, what, what the under, underlying assumptions. So I think you now maybe should be combined the director, may meant or the together. Yeah, it's good hypothesis. You now you can raise some questions. question formulated by Charles' presentation, but maybe Susan can, can, can help answer it. So, so you had a, a slide, and there were four items on the left and related to dose, and then what I would call management of, of, of risk on the right. And, and so you stopped, as I understand, with the arrival of the microorganism on, let's say, target organ. And my question is about the, the potential interaction that occurs there. For example, let's say that the environment on the target organ, let's assume it's, it's the lung, um, you were focused on inhalation, um, and, and there's uh, a hospitable versus a hostile environment for that organism. So we operate on the assumption that one tuberculosis bacterium, based on a study with ferrets or, or hamsters or somebody, some, something, some model, animal model, can cause tuberculosis. But we don't know much about the environment and what happened to that one organism that the animal was exposed to, or how relevant that model is to human tuberculosis. So, <clears throat> the, you know, let's just look at the exponential model for a moment. So the K value in the exponential is a measure of the success probability that that individual single organism will propagate to initiate infection and disease. Okay, so that's integrated over the entire subsequent steps. Um, you, you, you have two more questions that you, you implied there. Um, so, in fact, there are more detailed dose-response frameworks that have been looked at where you go not simply from inhaled dose, but you look at the in vivo deposited and then body burden dose and predicate your risk on that. And, you know, in fact, I had a review article in ES&T in end of 2014 that summarizes these more detailed dose response models. So they're out there. Um, your third question, which I didn't have time to answer, uh, you know, so a lot of the dose response data is based on animal studies, including the Legionella dose response model that I used. But every time that we've been able to compare an animal-derived dose response study to human outbreak data. We get good concordance. So my, my underlying working hypothesis is that if you have a competent animal model, you can use for respiratory, for example, the inhaled dose in the animal as a one-to-one -one proxy for human dose response based on inhaled dose in the human. Obviously, the respiratory volumes are going to be different, so you can't base an ear concentration be based on intake volume. Just to address the kind of microbial um, side of that question as well, there's some very new data has come out from the Australian group, uh, Mike Inouye's group, showing that the, the response of children to rhinovirus and respiratory infection is really, again, dependent on what type of microbial community they have in the upper airways, in which uh, children who are um, 
have a, an expansion of Maricela uh, in their upper airways, tend to have more severe upper airway infection, develop lower airway infection, and have febrile um, uh, symptoms. So this is an interactome, right? It's, it's, it's somewhat dependent on dose. It's somewhat dependent on the uh, ecosystem context and microbiological context that that uh, pathogenic organism is, is, is trying to invade or trying to uh, interact with. Um, and I think that that's a growing uh, concept in the field that they, and as I tried to point out earlier on, that you know the heterogeneity in response may be to some extent explained by the microbiological uh, colonization patterns in the airways or in the gastrointestinal tract, and it's something that I think is gaining ground and may be incorporated into these these great models that are are there already to make them even more predictive uh, when we have some of these components that seem to dictate these infection outcomes. Uh, so I had a. I suppose it's a comment and, and, and a question. It speaks to some of this and just what you've been talking about now, Susan, is that um, we've been thinking about this in, uh, in other contexts in the microbiome, but the importance of cumulative risk assessment and risk assessment in relation to mixtures, um, both, both when the stresses are, are the chemicals or microbes and their components of interest and characteristics of the people and whatever. So uh, I know that it's still in its infancy, but um, I think down the road we'll have to at least speak to the newer methods, both uh, of the studies and the way they're analyzed into accounting for this. Any comments? Uh, more questions? We're done with this session. <laughs> it's wrapped up. <laughs>